Our second lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 through 43. May you too, and not just the children, listen to this reading as a love letter from God. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and all at once, he shrieks. It throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, How much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Eight days after Jesus delivers the unwelcome news to his disciples that he must undergo great suffering and rejection, be killed, and then be raised from the dead, he takes Peter, John, and James on a long hike up a mountain, after which he goes off to pray and the three disciples collapse and begin to doze off. What happens next must have seemed like a dream. Jesus, his face shining bright, standing with two people that the disciples somehow knew were Moses and Elijah. Let's just acknowledge it right off the bat. This is a really strange story. It sounds more like a dream than reality, because the truth is most of us have never seen anything like what is described here. When Jesus' face is glowing and his clothes are bright white. But it's not the first time something like this happens in the Bible. As we heard Jim read in our first lesson, when Moses would go up Mount Sinai to talk to God, he would come back down with his face radiating light so much so that the people of Israel were afraid to look at him. It sounds strange to us, and yet there are experiences in our lives that do involve what could be called transfiguration, moments when we see another person, especially the face of another person, in a completely altered state. Think about the experience of falling in love. There's a period of time, especially at the beginning, when it's like your mind is chemically altered, so that just to see the face of the person you love produces all kinds of wonderful feelings. It's part of why we have the expression, love is blind. Love alters how we see another person. This also happens when we have children, whether they are our biological children or adopted or nieces or nephews or grandchildren. I remember the first couple of months of my children's lives 
feeling drawn to look at their faces as if there was some kind of magnetic attraction between my eyes and their face. I could have looked at them for hours. I've seen a similar magnetic connection when a person is dying and their loved ones are sitting by their bedside looking into their faces which such, with such love and intimacy that it can be difficult to watch. In all these ways and more, we have seen faces transfigured. And these moments of transfigurations are moments we desperately want to hold on to, just as Peter wants to find a way to make Jesus' transfiguration last. The summer after my sophomore year in high school, a friend invited me to go on a camping and canoeing trip with her family. To prepare for the trip, they gave me a list of equipment that I needed to buy, a backpack, a high-tech sleeping bag, some serious rain gear. My friend suggested that I fill up my backpack and then spend some time walking around with it on to get used to the weight, and I followed her advice. But the truth was that no amount of practicing with my new fancy camping equipment could have prepared me for the hardest part of the trip. The first couple of days, we mostly spent canoeing, and I went to bed with aching arms and shoulders. But the third day, we had several portages, where we had to carry first the canoes and then our backpacks overland from one body of water to another. That third day, one of the portages involved a steep uphill climb, followed by an equally long and steep downhill. The next day, I woke up with pain in muscles I did not know that I had. That's from yesterday's hiking downhill, my friend's father informed me. He went on to explain that when we walk uphill, we naturally lean forward. Yes, there's some resistance and we build muscle, but it's different from how our bodies respond to a downhill slope. On a downhill, we tend to lean backward, tensing at the pull of gravity, arching our backs to keep from falling. It's the downhill hike that leaves us sore the next day because it's harder on our bodies to go downhill than up. And no amount of walking around my house with a backpack on could have prepared me for that. When Peter, James, John, and Jesus come down from the mountain, they are immediately confronted with a situation for which they are ill-equipped and unprepared. There is yet another crowd looking for Jesus because they want him to heal someone, a young boy. Apparently, some of the disciples who didn't go up the mountain and witness the transfiguration had been trying to heal the boy, but without success. So Jesus steps in and heals him, but not before he gives these disciples a piece of his mind, accusing them of being faithless. The Jesus we see here at the bottom of the mountain is almost the polar opposite of the Jesus we saw at the top, face shining, heralded by God as the beloved chosen one. Apparently coming down from the mountain isn't so easy for Jesus either. Mountaintop experiences, whether it's a new love or a new baby or the difficult but sublime experience of a loved one's death, or an NBA championship followed by going up three to one in the World Series, these are experiences we would love to stay with forever, in part because we know that what comes next is going to demand more of us. It's what happens after the honeymoon, when the marriage begins and a couple has to work out all the logistics and annoyances of living together and discovering each other's best and worst selves. It's what comes after the first exciting phase of a new job or a new school or moving to a new city. It's the time after the baby comes when the excitement and anticipation fades and suddenly you are left with this creature who does nothing but eat and cry and poop and with much effort and coaxing sleep for a little while. Then within just a couple of years, there is the discovery that children, particularly toddlers and teenagers, 
have an uncanny ability to make us feel ill-equipped and unprepared. My friend Amy heard this story in a parenting class she took. Actually, she says it's the only thing she remembers from that parenting class. The instructor of the class was in a Walmart on the day before Christmas. The checkout lines were endless. She noticed a woman in the line whose young daughter was in the cart surrounded by presents. Everyone else noticed them too. You couldn't help but notice them because the daughter, a toddler, was having a full-blown tantrum, screaming her head off, arms flailing, legs kicking. It was bad. But the mother didn't get out of line. She didn't apologize to those around her. She just looked at her daughter and kept saying over and over in a calm, soft voice, it's going to be okay, Rosie. Hang in there, Rosie. You can get through this, Rosie. She kept saying those phrases quietly and calmly, and eventually the child calmed down and the mother checked out. The parenting instructor happened to check out at a different register about the same time, and she made a beeline for the woman, catching her just as she was about to leave the store. I teach parenting classes, she told her, and I just want to say how impressed I was with how you handled that situation. Rosie is one lucky girl to have you as her mother. The woman looked puzzled. My daughter's not Rosie, she said. I'm Rosie. Even though Jesus' words to the disciples who could not heal that boy are harsh, they suggest that Jesus, too, finds it hard to come down the mountain, back to the reality of his life and his calling and the people's endless need. Up on that mountain, the text tells us that Jesus was speaking with Moses and Elijah about his departure, which means they were talking about his crucifixion and death. Surely, this was a pep talk for Jesus, a chance for him to talk with two people, maybe the only two people, who had some inkling of what it feels like to try to lead God's people in the face of incredible resistance, even at the risk of your own life. Then immediately after this pep talk, Jesus comes down the mountain only to discover that the disciples have failed yet again to do the work he's been teaching them to do. No wonder he gets a little irritable. We all know how lousy it feels to come down from the high of a mountaintop experience and discover just how hard the task at hand is going to be. But if Jesus himself comes down from that mountain and finds himself feeling weary and short-tempered, ill-equipped and unprepared for the work God has called him to do, the good news is we don't need to beat ourselves up for feeling that way from time to time. In fact, it appears that sometimes feeling ill-equipped and unprepared means we are exactly where God wants us to be. Because it is at such times when we just might throw ourselves on the mercy of God and admit, God, I don't know if I can do this. Help me. Among my friends who are ministers, we often joke that our three years in seminary taught us almost nothing that we use on a daily basis in ministry. Turns out conjugating Greek and Hebrew verbs isn't something we do on a daily basis. Maybe you've experienced something similar in your profession. For me, that means nearly every day as a minister, I find myself in a situation for which I feel ill-equipped and unprepared. Now, I love a good challenge, and one thing I love about my job is the unpredictability of what I will face each day. But let me be clear, feeling ill-equipped and unprepared is not something I enjoy. I have yet to meet a person who enjoys that feeling. We are much more comfortable in situations we have been in before, where we know exactly what to do. And yet I've found that it's when we feel ill-equipped and unprepared that we are more likely to reach out for help to teachers, mentors, friends who can offer us guidance and support. Even more important, 
These moments are also when we might just remember how much we need God. I don't know about you, but I don't tend to turn to God as quickly when I am feeling confident and competent as when I am at the end of my rope, unsure of what to do next, when I desperately need to hear God say, it's going to be okay, Amy. Hang in there, Amy. You can get through this, Amy. And let's be honest, as a long-standing, respected church full of intelligent, talented, and competent people, the idea that being ill-equipped and unprepared is a prerequisite for discipleship is not one we want to hear. It's why we are so tempted to stay up on that mountaintop, to go back to the past, to remember a time when we had it all figured out. But the truth is, there never was a time we had it all figured out. Not me, not you, not this church, not any community of God's people. Sure, we have had our mountaintop moments, but they were just that, moments. And the rest of our time is spent on the long climb up or the even more difficult walk down. Fortunately, all we have to do is glance through the Bible to discover that the history of God's people and their leaders involves a long list of ill-equipped and unprepared folks. Moses, with his hot temper and poor public speaking. Elijah, who faces constant challenges and hides out in caves full of self-pity. David, murderer, adulterer, and Israel's greatest king. Mary and Joseph, who, let's face it, are totally ill-equipped and unprepared to be parents, much less parents of the Savior of the world. And then there are the disciples, who prove over and over again that God has no interest in followers who are well-equipped, well-prepared, or particularly competent. God calls people, real people, ill-equipped, unprepared, deeply flawed people, and gathers them together into community where they must rely on one another and on God. God has never and will never ask us to go on this journey of discipleship alone. It is up on the mountain where Jesus gets to hear his mentors, Moses and Elijah, offer empathy and encouragement in the face of the suffering that awaits him. And up on that mountain, Jesus also gets to hear God say again, just when he needs to hear it most, you are my beloved son, the chosen one. If Jesus needs help from his friends and a reminder of God's love and God's call, then we can expect that from time to time, we're going to need it too. When we are feeling unprepared and ill-equipped, it's an opportunity for us to admit just how much we need each other and how much we need God. The journey of faith was never meant to be a solo journey, nor is it supposed to be easy or predictable. So if today or any day, you find yourself feeling ill-equipped and unprepared, sore to the bone from that walk down from the mountaintop. Know that you are exactly where God wants you to be, and you are not on this journey alone. Amen.